Welcome to episode 41 of Fascinating, a Star Trek podcast. The Deadly Years In this week's episode, the Enterprise crew find a malady has caused the entire crew of an outpost to age prematurely and ultimately die. When the same symptoms start to affect their landing party, the key to survival may lie in figuring out why Chekhov alone is unaffected. With their competency waning, can the crew solve the puzzle, or will their time be up far too soon? Now this isn't gonna hurt a bit. That's what you said the last time. Did it hurt? Yes. Good evening, Ian. Did that hurt? I don't know about pain, but I'm far too hot. Warm, isn't it? Unbearable. An uncommon term in Glasgow in January. It's not a complaint I have often, I have yeah. to admit, but some fool has turned the thermostat way mm. too high. Talking of heat, there's an old flame for Kirk once again in this episode. Very good, Ian. I like that. A little segue there. Yeah, he's got a, an old flame in every port. It's with almost the Exactly the same story as the one that he met in Court Martial. They all love him. And they yeah, can't. they're obsessed. They are obsessed. But yet, they don't stay with him. No, or he doesn't stay with them. I thought it was quite interesting when they aged up the crew here to compare it with how we now know they, they looked as older mm. men. Not, not quite spot on, but... What are your thoughts on the effects? The makeup? I thought it was nicely done. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um... It didn't look stupid. No. Not like the pigmen from a few weeks ago. And again, we're watching it on high definition Absolutely. devices. I'm sure yeah. it would have been even more satisfactory. The only one that was questionable was uh, Scotty with his white hair and white eyebrows. McCoy went blonde as well for some reason. And long haired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't generally get more hair as you get older. Not normally. And he went a bit more country. He did. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a very good, for a bottle, I mean, it was essentially a bottle episode, mm -hmm. but if you accept the bit right to the start, I thought it was a very good one. Yeah, I would agree. I had a lot of fun watching it. We've discussed bottle episodes, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Are you just saying yes, I don't get into it? Yeah. It's when it takes place almost entirely on the ship, on set. Makes sense. Shall we get on with this one? Yeah, I'm roasting, let's crack on. As I just mentioned, we begin on a settlement. Yeah, not in a bottle. No, that's what I'm saying. Apart from the bit before the credits, it was essentially a, anyway. Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Scotty, Chekhov, and Galway. Oh, I feel bad for her. Arlene, a new blue shirt. Yeah, they arrived down on Gamma Hydra Four. Things aren't looking good for her, are they? As soon as you see her, you're thinking, "Yep." It's not even a red shirt, but she looks doomed. Yeah, She's got a doomed face, doomed expression. And she's tiny. She's very wee. I don't know if she is technically a, a small person, but. She certainly is a small person. As close as. Yeah. Anyway, Kirk seems surprised that they're not met at the landing point. Yeah, even though they were scheduled to carry out the annual check of this particular expedition. He points out that he spoke with the leader, a Robert Johnson, only one hour before. But he sensed something was, was wrong. Yes, he seemed a bit foggy and he spoke strangely. Maybe he was having a little smoke. Who knows? Chekhov is sent to check out one building while Kirk and Spock look at another. Yeah, he enters this darkened place and after fumbling around for lights, he screams like a big baby on discovering an old dead body. I, I wasn't convinced with, with his reaction. This is a crew who on a weekly basis are faced with death and their colleagues dying all over, over the place being murdered. It's a dead body. Yeah, I don't think he's scared so much of the dead body. It's the fact that the lights don't come on until he's right on top of it. It's more, I think, of a shock than a fright, if that makes sense. He still wasn't too happy. He does run out crying for his captain. Yeah. Oh, captain, captain, captain. Yeah, so he goes out, tells the others what he's found before they all go back in and McCoy confirms that he died from old age. It was very quick again from McCoy. He's got his little scanner. Tells him. Does that tell you old display age? comes up and says old age. I'm not sure how that would work. Natural causes, no poisons. Anyhow, he's wrong. We'll find that out later on. Well, Spock himself says it is impossible. Yes, because there's nobody over, I think, their late 20s on the expedition. 
Yeah, at this point they're interrupted by a doddery old man and woman. Yes, and that causes some concern for Kirk when the man explains that he is Robert Johnson, the leader of the expedition. The woman with him is his wife Elaine, and despite appearing to be in their 80s, their claim is they are 29 and 27 years old. The proverbial hard paper round. Very hard paper round. Although I suppose when you do a feature every other week looking at someone who looks much older than they really are <laughs> on this show. And here we get into the credits. Followed by the captain's log. There only has one, I think, this week. I think you'll find you're wrong, but we'll discuss it if another one comes up. Okay. <laughs> 3478 point two. Four of the colony of six are dead. And the Johnsons are dying of old age. Down in sick bay, Kirk tries to talk to Johnson, but he's away with the fairies by now. Is he? He says he's not deaf. Kirk's shouting at him. Yeah, but he doesn't understand what he's being asked, or he can't respond in a coherent way. All he does is repeat that Elaine was so beautiful. We'll have to take your word for that. There was no evidence of it as far as I can see. Kirk leaves at this point, asking to be advised if the couple become lucid. Yeah, they're heading to the, the briefing room. We get a little bit of exposition here from Kirk, explaining who Stalker and Dr. Wallace are. Yeah, tell us who they are. Well, I think Stoker's just been appointed as the head of Starbase 10 and this colony falls into his new administrative area and they're taking him there, obviously. Dr. Wallace is an expert in endocrinology. I presume she's also headed to Starbase 10. Dr. Janet Wallace. Kirk no. calls her Jan. Sometimes, it's not yeah. like you to use a longer version of a name than the, the actual episode. McCoy explains the problem with the Johnsons. Yeah, they're growing older by the minute. But we all are. Yes, and he's no, re no idea why. Spock says that an analysis of the planet's atmosphere has also produced no helpful information. And so Kirk suggests that as they're close to the neutral zone, maybe the Romulans are testing out a new weapon. That is another fantastical... It's just an idea. Spock is investigating the possibility and Kirk wants all theories in play, even if they are cuckoo. Yeah, and he tells him that they'll be staying in orbit until they do so. Yeah, he tells Stalker that because he's anxious to get to his new posting. He would be. I can understand why. I have a lot of sympathy for Stalker in this episode. He reminds me a bit of Galileo 7. Remember the com the Commodore or the Commissioner in that episode yeah. who wanted to make his rendezvous. He didn't care that the crew were all missing. I thought you were going to say the Commodore from Police Academy, Lissard. No, okay. didn't remind me of him at all. Did he not? No. All right. So they all file out of the meeting room, with the exception of Janet, who stays behind, and not to the displeasure of Kirk. Is there something I can do for you? Well, be a little less the cool, efficient captain and a little more the old friend. How long has it been? Six years, four months, and an odd number of days. You mean you don't know? Mm. A long time. Things wouldn't change if it started all over again, would it? You have your job, I have my ship, and neither one of us will change. You said it, I didn't. In all those years, I only heard from you once. A star crime when my husband died. You know, you never asked me why I got married after we called it off. Well, I suppose that you met someone you loved. I met a man I admired, a great man. And in the same field as you, you didn't have to give up a thing. No. Just you. Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock would like to see you on the bridge. She is one step away from being a, a mad stalker, I think. Yeah, you can see Kirk, they're trying to manage the situation and, mm. and very pleased to get away, I think. So, an ex-girlfriend and she's able to reel off the, the number of days since she, you split up. Yeah, and expecting you to also know how many days it's been as if you've not moved on. I'd be hiding my bunnies if I was him. The fact that he's only written to her once in that entire time didn't give her a clue <laughs> as to how he felt. I like the fact that he sent a stargram. I like to imagine that's like a telegram, but in the voice of David Bowie. <laughs> yeah. Up on the bridge, Spock once again confirms that he hasn't been able to find anything unusual about the planet. 
and he's now working on a rogue comet that recently passed by. Stalker then suggests that they go to his Starbase 10. We should be clear, when you say Stalker, you mean Commodore Stalker and yes, not, not the Jan. Stalker. <laughs> he wants to get to Starbase 10 where he says the facilities are better suited to researching what is going on. Kirk takes that as an insult against his ship and declines this invitation, ordering Sulu to maintain orbit. Now, this puzzles Sulu. It does, because he thinks he's already had that order. Mm. And he shares a look with Spock, who seems concerned about something. Yeah. Down in sickbay. Lieutenant Galway comes in to complain about her hearing. Yeah, she's quite embarrassed. McCoy's not concerned, but she notes that she's never had any problem like this previously. No. We go to Kirk's quarters and another week where we... I like this, the fact he's taking his shirt off to speak to Spock. It's like, oh, Spock's calling, better get my top off. Oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> oh sorry, you caught me <laughs> undressing. Uh, do you want me to change? Well, no, no, it's okay. I can put something on if you want, or I can just keep... Uh... You imagine just before we, we got onto the scene, Spock's like, I really don't care. I just <laughs> want to give you my report. <laughs> Stop rubbing your nipples. There's no need to, for us to be a video call, Captain. No, yes. I think you should see me. But... <laughs> You're undressing. Exactly. Spock reports, anyhow, that all research has come up next. This is the third time that Spock has told Kirk his research has produced no results. Kirk tells him to look into the comet, and Spock reminds him that he already ordered that. So Kirk pretends to remember and says he's heading to sickbay. Yeah. It clearly troubles him, as does his back, which he gives a little bit of a rub to. Well, I think he's trying to put a shirt on and he injures himself in the mm. process, doesn't he? We've, uh, all, we've all been we've there. <laughs> So, down in sickbay, Kirk enters just as McCoy pulls the sheets over Robert's face and tells Kirk that he is the last of the six to perish from old age. McCoy's clearly quite frustrated. Yeah, well, it's old age, he can't. Yeah, but he doesn't have a diagnosis for this, he doesn't know why they've suddenly got old and died. That's true. In his office, we hear from, sorry, in McCoy's office, I should say, we hear from Scotty, who comes on comms asking to come up to sickbay. Yeah, and I think this is the first time we see the physical effects of what's going on because we see that uh, McCoy's temples are, are greying significantly. Yes, and Kirk taunts him about this, despite the fact a similar thing is happening to him. Yeah. We uh -huh. actually like this, but we see Kirk's hair starting to thin, but it mysteriously thickens up a bit when he gets older. This must have been quite an embarrassing episode for, for Shatter, or potentially. I th at this point, I think he's going bald or wears a toupee at this point. Yes, yeah, so you see this, at this stage of the episode, Kirk's hair starts to thin, but I think Shatner did make a point that um, he wasn't having that, so the older version of Kirk in a few scenes time has thicker white hair. Okay. He does ask McCoy at this point for help with the twinge in his shoulder and is uh, chastised for self-diagnosis. McCoy's done this in a few different episodes now. Yeah, I mean, I think Kirk says it's uh, just a, a, mus a muscular strain. Yeah, McCoy takes offence any time anybody tries to diagnose their own medical issues. Yeah, quite, I mean, it must be annoying for a doctor. Oh, yeah. doc, I've got I've this. looked it up on yeah. Google. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, McCoy gives him a bit of an examination. What does he discover? He has arthritis, and not just any old arthritis. Advanced arthritis that's spreading rapidly. Yeah, it's not what you want to hear. No, Kirk doesn't believe it's possible. And at this point, Scotty arrives looking much older than he usually does. He has aged decades. Kirk exclaims. And then I am proven wrong because we have another captain's log. Indeed we do. 3579.4. All the landing party are showing signs of ageing, except for Chekhov. Yes. I think um, they say Chekhov appears to be normal. That's relative. Yeah. He's an oddball. Very much so. He is now in sickbay performing exercises and taunting the others while Spock is being examined. They do indeed all look older. 30 years per day, according to McCoy, who still has no idea as to why. Yes, but Chekhov hasn't aged at all. It's not just that it's slower for him, it's not affected him. And Spock, he looks, in fairness, he looks fine at this point. I think he's a little bit of greying. It's a little bit of wrinkling. Yeah. He estimates that they have less than a week to live. Well, that doesn't really matter because they'll all be vegetables mentally well before that. Yeah, and also, I'm not sure of the calculation they do here. A couple of days, a week to live. They're aging 30 years per day. Yeah. In three days, that's 90, and they already are. Yeah, seven days would be 210 years. 
But then he's a Vulcan who does live past 100. But he's talking about the rest of them. I know. It's they. It maybe means as a group. I will live up to a week, you guys. <laughs> maybe tomorrow. So Kirk again demands answers and wants everyone working on it round the clock and to start by studying a Chekhov. Yes, I think he's horrified at this idea of total senility. I think he thinks it's a terrible way to go. At this point, McCoy tells Spock that he is fine, which Spock takes issue with. Yeah, he says his eyesight is failing and his concentration and his resistance to the cold is depleted. McCoy says that he didn't say he was unaffected, just that he's fine for a Vulcan on the wrong side of 100. Scotty, he wants to go back to his station. He'll be fine after a wee rest. But he does need help from Spock to actually leave the room at this point. Galway is also sent away but is very upset at the prospect. Yeah, she's panicking. Um, she doesn't want to go to sleep because she's scared of what she may find when she wakes up. I'd be more concerned about not waking up. Yeah, but that's not your problem. Certainly not mine, no. If you don't wake up, then yeah, somebody else can deal with it. Still a problem. No, you I mean, I don't go to when bed. When you're dead, you have no problems. Yeah, but it's not a problem just now when I'm alive. I mean, I don't think to myself, well, if I die tonight, it's cool. I don't want to die tonight. No, yeah, you don't want to die, but once you've actually died, it's no longer your, of course. your concern. Yeah. But she's concerned because she's awake and doesn't want to die. She does not want to die. So it's a problem right now. Or get older. I think she's more concerned about how she's going to look because she can't, catches a glimpse of herself in the mirror and is horrified. Yeah. She is given a, a bit of a carrot by Kirk, who allows her to return to duty. Yeah, and when she is left, he wonders why she looks older than him, even though she's 10 years younger. McCoy doesn't really know, other than that people age at different rates. That's true. He again demands to know what Chekhov's secret is, and so Chapel gets him onto the table. And he is very creepy with her. Is he? She promises him that, oh sorry, he, she tells him it's not going to hurt too much, but it might hurt a little bit, and he says, oh, promises. <laughs> I didn't pick up on that, okay. I've seen him be a bit creepy yeah, a few times. Yeah, he can be a bit touchy-feely. We're in the outer area of sickbay, where Janet tells him of an experiment that she and her husband had. It uses carbohydrate compounds to slow down the degeneration of plant life. And so McCoy says, yeah, we'll give that a try then. But do it quickly, stop talking. I'm not sure if plants and humans are the same thing. Well, it's biological life. Kirk's heading for the bridge and asks to be kept informed. Outside in the corridor, he leaves and finds that Janet is waiting for him. Yep. With more harassment. It's the only word for it. Yeah. She starts asking him... Well, she, first of all, she tells him that she wasn't over him when she got married. And he now starts to see what's going on. Asks her about the age difference with her husband, which was 26 years. I think he's worried that she has an old man fetish. Yes, that's it, isn't it? I mean, what other explanation could it be? We're, we're, we're dying here by the, by the minute. And she's suddenly much more attracted to him. And oh, but yeah, but, but never mind that. It's like this; it should not be a concern. No, unless we're talking about the the cliche of you know you're in an aeroplane and it's about to crash. You might as well. Might as well. Everyone just starts going for it with everyone else. Well, that's what Kirk says. He says, "Are you offering me a going away present?" <laughs> Up on the bridge, Chekhov is whining to Sulu about all the tests he's had to undergo. It's not the attitude you'd expect from a concerned crewmate. He's Precis the one that's not dying. He's not dying. Yeah, he's fine. Everyone else is. You'd think. Anything I can do, guys. I'll, I'll help you. This is... Yeah, you all might be gone. And whatever can I, can I, can I do here? Oh, no, he's making me this. run and taking my blood. He's not a team player. Kirk enters and orders an increase in orbit to 20,000 miles perigee. Do you know what that was? No. It's the closest point of the orbit, so... It's not a perfect circle. Obviously, the planet's not perfectly spherical, so at the closest point of the orbit, there should be 20,000 miles up. Thanks for that. People will be interested. Mm-hmm. But if someone said, oh, X, that's really interesting. Yeah. Sure. One person they should hopefully tweet us. There's a yeoman on the bridge and she asks Kirk to sign a report. Which he struggles to do. And this is noticed by the yeoman and stalker, who is there to try again to persuade him to go to the starbase. Kirk wants to know what he's doing on the bridge and says that no, they're not leaving until they have a cure. He does, however, offer to send a message on behalf of the, the worried Commodore. Spock reminds him that he's already done that this morning. Kirk ignores Spock and asks the yeoman to pass him this report to sign. <laughs> yeah, so he sits down in his seat and we see, I think, him start to realise what's happening to yeah. him. Well, he angrily disputes the suggestion that he might have already signed, but obviously sees his own signature on the document. Yeah, so sometime later, on the bridge, he's fallen asleep in his chair like every grandpa. <laughs> 
Yeah, and when awoken, he pretends that he was just in a state of contemplation. That's exactly what I would do <laughs> if I fell asleep at my work. Yeah. Someone came in, oh, oh, yeah, just, just um, thinking, thinking over some yeah. things. I liked the way that Spock was so gentle with him to wake him up as well. He kind of goes up a little, little uh, up on the arm and just goes, Captain! <laughs> <laughs> Spock at least has some positive news for him. You have something to report? Yes, sir. I believe we have the cause of the affliction. What is it? The orbit of Gamma Hydra 4 carried the planet directly through the comet's trail. On conventional radiation settings, we discovered nothing. I'm resetting our sensors to the extreme lower range of the scale, undetected radiation appeared. Below normal radiation levels, but definitely present, and undoubtedly residue from the comet. Good spark. Well done. Let's get this to Dr. McCoy immediately. Oh, Lieutenant, take a message to Starfleet Command. Aye, sir. And due to the proximity of the Romulans, better use code two. But, Captain, the Romulans have broken code two. If you remember the last bullet. Then use code three. Uh, yes, sir, code three. Message. Key to affliction may be Comet, which passed by Gamma Hydra 4. Said Comet is now. Quadrant 448, sir. Uh, quadrant. All units are to be alerted. For complete analysis of radiation and means found to neutralize it, the comet is highly dangerous, Kirk commanding enterprise. Immediately, Lieutenant, let's Aye, go. Sir. Oh, Mr. Sulu, increase orbit to 20,000 mile parity. You mean another 20,000, Captain? I think Kirk here covers his embarrassment with anger. Yes, he starts railing on people who question his orders and says he expects them to be followed. And Spock has to step in to calm the situation down. How does he do that? He asks Sulu to confirm the current position and on hearing that it is indeed 20,000 miles perigee, Kirk orders it maintained. And everyone else wonders why they've not used the word perigee in any of the previous 40 episodes when they went into orbit of somewhere. <laughs> He rolls his eyes and walks out. Down in sick bay, McCoy is having a go at Spock for not finding the answer sooner, but he points out that his mental capacity has been diminished. He does. Kit leaves and Spock tells McCoy that the temperature is getting increasingly uncomfortable and wonders what can be done about it. However, McCoy has reverted to being an old country doctor. And not a magician. Indeed. Wallace at this point says that their existing radiation therapies won't work. McCoy says they must start from scratch, which reminded me a bit of Mary. Remind me? He had to make the antidote to the, yeah. the illness that only affected adults. In the corridor, once again, Stalker stops Spock to query the captain's fitness for command. I like how he played him here. I like I liked his, uh, his tactic. Who's tactic? Stalkers. Okay. Spock points out that he too is affected, so there's no basis for him to take command. And so Stalker jumps in this to prove his point, as he says that if Spock considers himself not up to the job, then Kirk certainly won't be. Yes, and Spock's initial resistance to the suggestion of an extraordinary competency hearing fades away when Stalker threatens to quote regulations at him that he knows very well. And so, unable to deny this, he reluctantly agrees to a hearing at 2pm. Why is he not being logical about this? That's the type of thing that Spock, taking the emotion out of it. Confused. He said that he's having trouble concentrating. His thought process isn't as swift as it usually is. In fact, I think he said to McCoy in the previous scene that um, McCoy says, why is it taking you so long? And Spock says something like, uh, brain goes slow. Yeah, okay. And sick pay. Kirk and McCoy stand over a nervous check-off, as we heard at the top of the podcast, before a frail Arlene collapses in the doorway. Arlene is... Uh, Galway. Galway, yeah. yeah. she's dead. Kirk's a wee bit shocked, and McCoy says that they have days or hours left. It's got a fairly big margin okay, for well, What is it? I mean, days could be like 30 or 40 days or hours. Somewhere from two. seconds to months. <laughs> yeah. At some point. It's like the old uh, Doctor Doctor. Um, how long do I have to live? And the doctor says five. He says, five what? And the doctor says four. <laughs> <laughs> In the briefing room. Yes. 
We're now going to take a break from this urgent medical research to have a court hearing. <laughs> yeah, this was nonsense, wasn't it? The whole thing is How absurd. would you do this? They potentially get hours to live and they're going to waste time with this, with Yet another, bureaucracy. Yes. Yes, Kirk is there and he's unhappy, but Spock gets the hearing underway. Stalker makes his initial statement about being denied the request to go to Starbase 10 before Kirk has his less than convincing say. Yes, he thinks the whole thing should be called off because he quite rightly understands there are more important things to worry about. Now, this was one of the weaknesses I thought in the episode. If you age naturally, it's a progressive degeneration. So you don't understand that perhaps your faculties aren't as um, strong as they once were. But this has happened in the space of hours. If I suddenly became really sore and I couldn't, I would know that it was, I wouldn't argue against it. The character's taking the position here of an old man, but not acting like someone who's became old within a very short time period. Yeah, but I think Kirk still believes that he is in control. He doesn't want to accept how bad it's got. Yeah, see, that's what I, 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 I don't accept that. He maybe should accept it. He wouldn't. I, I agree. He knows he's ill. They've all he, talked about how ill they are. Mm. And they don't have much time left. But he doesn't want to accept that he is no longer the best person to be making command decisions. I don't know. He's trying to deny it like like your, your grandfather would when you tell him that he can't drive anymore. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm still fine. You see, he has a good line of argument that he doesn't use. We'll, we'll get to it in a moment. So Spock says that he can't cancel the hearing, but Kirk can cross-examine the witnesses, although... He doesn't get given that opportunity. <laughs> Who's first up? Sulu. Spock asks him about the, the double orbit order. Yes, and then the second occasion it happened as well about the uh, distance he was to maintain his orbit at. And okay. Sulu confirms that yes, on two occasions he receives duplicate orders. Yeah, reluctantly. Yeah. Yeoman Atkins then is also very reluctant to speak out against Kirk. She, yeah, she tries to offer a defence of his actions but also confirms that he tried to sign the same report twice. And then Uhura is asked about, I don't think we talked about this, did we? The message to Starbase, or was a message to Starfleet. Yeah. Um, Kirk asked it to be sent in code 2, forgetting that the Romulans had broken code 2. Yeah, it was in the clip. Yeah, okay. Finally, Spock interrupts McCoy's micro-sleep, and we hear from him, and the report produced on his behalf using the ship's computer. Medical banks, compute described subjects' physical age using established norms as comparative base. Working subject's physical age based on physiological profile between 60 and 72, aging rapidly. Oh, I'm 34. I'm 34 years old. The computer differs with you, Captain. Dr. McCoy. Yes. Will you give us your professional evaluation of Captain Kirk's present physical condition? Captain Kirk is suffering from a, a peculiar physical degeneration which strongly resembles aging. Is not his mental capacity degenerating even more rapidly? Yes, yes, but he's a better man right now, Doctor. You heard the computer's analysis of Captain Kirk's physical age. Do you agree with it? It's a plastic machine, Spock. You can't argue with a machine. Do you agree with it, Doctor? this point Spock has finished his case and Stalker doesn't want to raise any points but Kirk also opts not to cross-examine any of the remaining witnesses but it does try to put forward a defense however it does more harm than good yeah he gets the name of the planet that they're orbiting wrong twice I think and tries to explain that way by telling Spock that he's just confused and he's been put under pressure by having this hearing when everything else is going on but then when asking everyone to ask him questions, you know, it's the kind of thing, you know, I'll prove I'm not incompetent, ask me anything. And they don't really want to, it's not what they have to do here. Yeah, it's almost as if he perceives Spock's interrogation as an act of mutiny. Yes. Now, the defence he should have used is that 
these examples they're giving are very minor things and the orders that are being duplicated were good orders. He wasn't asking them to do anything absurd or, I mean, apart from the Romulan code thing, which Uhura sorted out in oh, a apart from that. second. <laughs> apart from that. Yeah, but the, there's safeguards in place for that. So <laughs> he wasn't asking Sula to do something stupid with the orbits. He wasn't asking no. the yeoman to do something stupid with the forms. Uh, and literally the three occasions, and the worst they can say about him is that he repeated an order? Is that really sufficient grounds to remove a captain from no, the command it, of his vessel? It's not, and I agree with you. However, however, you cannot wait until he does make a stupid mistake on, on a, a starship in space. You make one stupid mistake, you can all be dead. You have to err on the side of caution. And it's obviously, they're starting to see the, the decline and thinking we better nip this in the bud mm. just now before he does do something catastrophic. Anyhow, he heads to his quarters to let the rest of them vote. And Stalker says that as Spock is not capable of taking command himself, it will need to be he himself who takes over the vessel, which Spock's not happy about. Yeah, and also, why would... We've seen Sulu in the past, I think, lead the... Yeah, he should be next in line. He's not affected. No. So that would make sense. Stalker could be there on the bridge, you know, monitoring what's going on, but mm -hmm. Sulu should be the guy making the decisions. Yeah, because Spock points out that Stalker has no experience so and no field experience. Yeah, and reminds him of the potential of attack from the Romulans. And not only does Stalker not care about this, he tells Sulu they're going to cut across the neutral zone to get to the starbase. Now, is a neutral zone an area where you cannot go, or is it just an area where you're not allowed to attack? You're not meant to go into anyone. Are you it's, sure? Yes, but what will happen is the Romulans will be there anyway because they're bad. Yeah. And if you go in, they'll use that as... You invaded the neutral zone, therefore we are entitled to attack you. Okay. And it was you who started this. In Kirk's quarters, a solemn Spock and Janet enter and confirm that he has been relieved of his position. He assumes that Spock wants to take command himself and accuses his first officer of stabbing him in the back. You see, this isn't... I don't understand this. If you're getting old, there's nothing to suggest... Okay, had he aged naturally at like this, you wouldn't have assumed that he would suddenly start making things up about Spock's character. Spock doesn't want to take command. He never has. This is, this is him just ageing. I not... think he's just angry and he's lashing out. Okay. Because he's had his ship taken off him. Fair enough. But he's surprised to hear that Spock is not the one who's taking command and more surprised to hear that Stalker is the man who has. Yeah, a uh, paper pusher. And again, Kirk's analysis is spot on here. He's not showing signs of incompetence. This is a reasonable concern. Yeah. He orders Spock to take over. But he yes, refuses. He does. He says only Stalker can issue command orders and rubbing Kirk, it in. <laughs> Kirk kicks him out of his room. <laughs> but it's obvious that he is tired and I think he sits himself down in a resigned manner. Yes. Uh, he's left here with Janet, I think, and she says that she has work to do and will have to leave. And he asks her if he's getting old. Yeah. I think he starts to feel a bit sorry for himself. I think so. Kirk, however, now is down in McCoy's office when Spock shows up. And Kirk, <laughs> I thought this was quite good, asks if he's trying to relieve McCoy now. Yeah. And they're all noticeably more decrepit. Indeed. Nothing yet has shown up about Chekhov, but Kirk suddenly recalls that the young Ensign was very scared when he first saw the body. And they, they wonder whether this might have something to do with it. Yes, yes, no, that, that could be. Right, scared. Heart beats faster. Breath gets short and there's cold sweats, adrenaline froze, adrenal activity. Now hold, hold on just a minute. There's something that I read once. It was ancient history, just after the atomic age, uh, used for radiation sickness. Adrenaline. Doctor. Pyrotalin is the specific accepted for all radiation sickness. Yes, yes. Now, before that adrenaline, highly promising, early research, but they abandoned it when Hyronlin was discovered. Quite possible, Doctor. Perhaps a sufficiently efficacious compound could be developed. Well, don't just stand that jaw and spunk. You and Dr. Wallace get cracking. Yeah, so after he tells him to crack on, we have a, a short research montage. Yes. 
They should have played some Muzak in the back. Or some Rocky yes. training. Um, down in the bridge. Or up, up in the bridge. bridge. Yes, as soon as they enter the neutral zone, the Enterprise is approached and attacked by Romulan ships in a very predictable way as Stalker freezes. Yeah, in the captain's chair. Kirk, uh, feeling the effects of the attack on the ship, wants to go up to the bridge but is prevented by the nurse. And McCoy, yeah. And, in fact, Janet. Janet as well, yes. If all three of them are there. He's hustled into the ward area instead. And so whilst pacing, Stalker tells Ahura to keep trying to communicate with the Romulans as he thinks he can talk his way out of things. This shows a real naivety, I think. Yes, yeah, so Ahura explains to him that Romulans could care less about his explanations. And Sulu confirms that is indeed the case. We've met them before. Yeah, just as they take another hit. Down in sickbay, a restless Kirk bemoans the Greenhorn. Although McCoy tells them that they can do nothing as Spock enters with a crude and untested serum. Potentially dangerous. Yeah, but there's nothing to lose. There have been there are two ma major ways well, they can die here. Again, it's much like Mary, where McCoy gives himself the vaccine. Yeah. Kirk, as uh, the captain or the former captain, demands the first shot. Wallace warns not to do it. It could kill them. But I think Kirk is, like you say, at the point of we've got nothing to lose. Yeah, I don't think that's in the... <laughs> you might die. Yeah. He's strapped down, but having taken the substance, begins to convulse. However, Janet notices that he's getting stronger and to stop aging. Up on the bridge, Sulu notes that they're still being attacked. <laughs> And Stoker remains as useful as a chocolate teaspoon. Yeah, he says, okay, well, all we can do is surrender. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not a great analysis. No, especially when Chekhov points out that the Romulans don't take prisoners. No, they don't. And the power on the ship is failing as Stoker begins to panic. Yeah, however, just as things look hopeless, who should appear on the bridge but a young and healthy Kirk who takes over command and makes all the right decisions? He does. He gets a report, contacts engineering and sets up an escape. He has Uhura transmit a false message using the code they know is cracked, which for a moment gives them all pause for thought. Yeah, she doesn't understand or she doubts him for a, a brief moment, but he firmly repeats his order. And we get a repeat mention of the Corbomite manoeuvre here. Yes, he says that they'll have to utilise the recently installed uh, Corbomite device. Which is the exact same play that he made back then. Yeah. This apparently will destroy everything within 200,000 kilometres and will create a dead zone that will need to be avoided for four years and it's going to take place in one minute. The plan works much better on this occasion than it did in the episode called the Corbomite Maneuver but it didn't really work. No. And the Romulans back off. As they do so the Enterprise hits the warp button and zooms off safely towards Starbase 10. And Kirk reminds Stalker that starships are better than starbases. Yeah, although Stalker does tell him that he was only doing what he thought was best. And I believe that he's not a, he wasn't a bad... Yeah, no, he's not malicious, he's just incompetent. Yeah. Or not competent in this area. McCoy comes up to the bridge and confirms that he and Scotty are also now on the mend. And Spock appears increasingly anxious for his shot at the vaccine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like this. McCoy says he's got a very potent shot lined up from him and he's had to remove all uh, breakables as a precaution. They and Stalker leave as Wallace enters the bridge. Yeah, and so Kirk hands control over to Sulu as he obviously has other things in his mind. Yes, and there's a wee joke about repeating orders just as they tail off. Yeah. And do, you, they... do you think he's going to take her back to his quarters and uh, they're going to get down to it? I don't think she'll be attracted to him anymore. Yeah, too young. He's too young for her. They're off on their next adventure. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a good good episode here. You still feel feel that? I do, yeah. I thought there were very few weaknesses. Um, it was engaging throughout. It was interesting. Mm -hmm. There was a little bit of a leap when they got the solution. Yeah. But we've had that many times before. It doesn't really bother us now. That Commodore was not in any way equipped for command of the Starship. No, he wasn't. Um, and and th as mentioned, the, the effects, the practical effects, the makeup were good. I thought when I uh, heard what this episode was about, I thought this might be a, a laughing matter, but no, it stood no, up very well. It did. And I think we've mentioned already that it was strange that the senior officers struggled to recognise their own incapacity. Mm -hmm. it was, they didn't all become 
It was interesting. I think this is mentioned in some people's notes as trivia, but I don't think it's trivia. They weren't all affected the same way. No. So Galway just aged really quickly. Kirk lost his mental faculties. Scotty's hair went grey. Spock had the various maladies he mentioned and McCoy grew long blonde hair and started talking in a stronger accent. <laughs> Yeah, age does, and aging does affect people in different ways. He's off for a mint julep now. Yeah, and he's maybe sucking a piece of straw. Straw. Yeah. Should we go on with some trivia? Yeah, why not? I'm still warm. It's not as warm. No, it's cooling down. The episode originally aired on the eighth of December, nineteen sixty-seven. Directed once again by Joseph Pevney, the eleventh of his fourteen. And again, go back to Arena if you want to hear more about him. David P. Harmon was the writer. This was the first of two original series episodes and he also wrote one animated series episode. He also wrote for shows like Hawaii Five-0, The Brady Bunch and Starsky and Hutch and he died in 2001 at the age of 82. Charles Drake played Commodore Stalker. This was his only Star Trek episode but he had a prolific career appearing in many TV shows as well as movies like The Swimmer opposite Burt Lancaster, Conflict opposite Humphrey Bogart and Harvey opposite James Stewart. Did you say Charles Drake? Yes. Not Charlie Drake? Apparently not. Okay. He died in 1994 when he was 76. Sarah Marshall, she played Janet Wallace. This was her only appearance in the original Star Trek series, but she also showed up in series like Remington Steel and Cheers, as well as the movie Dave. Her first husband was Carl Held, who you might remember played Lindstrom, the annoying lieutenant from Return of the Archons that they mm. left behind at the end of the episode. Yeah. And she died in 2014 when she was 80. Beverly Washburn played the unfortunate tiny officer Arlene Galway. This was her only Star Trek episode, but she appeared in shows like Wagon Train and when she was a child in the Ray Milland show. I thought we were to see The Wizard of Oz. No. I mean, Ray Milland was in Columbo, so oh, it's kind yeah. of a connection. It's a terrible connection. <laughs> the best we've got this week. She's now 77 years old, so ironically, first to die in the episode and longest lasting and as people, after that. And as people get older, obviously, they, they do shrink. So it'll be interesting to know what size Oh, she's probably about three feet three. Yeah. But she's, she's grown. Oh, I don't know. TV can add inches, can't it? Despite... Well, I'd like to think so. <laughs> despite this being a Romulan episode, we didn't see any actual Romulans, which is cheaper. We know that they're an expensive enemy. Yeah, to put those ears on. The last part, and this goes back to something you said earlier about having fewer notes than usual. The, sh the script was shorter and they had to cut a scene that was supposed to feature Kirk making his way to the bridge, getting younger as he went along because as older people, the characters spoke much more slowly and they weren't able to fit in quite as much dialogue as usual. Yeah. This is the first time we have Kirk's age established on screen. He's 34 at this oh, point, okay. if you believe him. <laughs> I don't believe that at all. In terms of international titles, the only one really worth mentioning is the German variation, which was Wie schnell die Zeit vergeht, How Quickly Time Goes By. Sounds like a sitcom for people over 70. Judy Dench and Jeffrey Palmer. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Next week, it's the 13th episode of season two, Obsession, which is just Janet again for 50 minutes, I think. I'm lucky for her. And in the meantime, you can find us all over social media. We're at Trek Podcast on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook. Find all the episodes on our YouTube channel and on www.astartrekpodcast.com where there's a post up for every show for you to leave your thoughts and complaints. Okay, until then, cheerio. Bye bye.